Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, welcome to our webinar for Peer Review Week 2016. The theme this year is all about recognizing the valiant efforts of the research community in performing and managing peer review. To discuss this, we've assembled a crack panel of speakers to discuss the topic of new and future approaches for acknowledging the peer review process. These are Andrew Preston, the founder of Publons, Katie Ridd, senior editor at Nature Communications, Alexander Nadenov, co-founder of Paperhive, and Stephanie Dawson, the CEO of Science Open. If any of them have to say anything interesting, please tweet or ask questions using the hashtag Peer Review Week uh, 16. The webinar will be recorded, and all slides will be made freely available afterwards. If you have any questions, please ask them in the question box uh, in the webinar, and we will address them in the discussion after the four talks. So I'm going to pass you over to Andrew Preston to get things rolling and uh, enjoy. Hello, everybody. Let me just get my screen up. Um, I hope you can see my slides now. So uh, uh, I'm Andrew Preston. I am one of the two co-founders of Publons. Uh, we started Publons about three years ago now. Um, really with a mission to speed up science. When we started Publons, really the, um, the thing that um, we saw that was really missing in the, in the whole world of research was uh, peer review is absolutely critical to the way we do things, but um, didn't seem to be getting the attention that it, that it deserves, um, both in terms of recognition but also in the way that we do it. And so we really founded Publons with a mission to speed up science by harnessing the power of peer review. So I just want to get through, um, I think, really three distinct things today. Talk about why recognizing review is so important. Um, explain a little bit about how Publons works and how you can get recognition for your reviews today. And then I think really set the scene for what I think are going to be a few really interesting talks um, following on from this one um, about new and future ways. Um, that we think peer review might be done. And I'll talk about a few things that we're working on in that area as well. So why is recogni recognizing review so important? Um, it really seems to me that the recognition for review is going to be the foundation for all of the future innovations um, in, in the space that is um, academic research. The reason for that is that while it is our job as researchers to publish um, and conduct novel research, at the end of the day, we're standing on the sh shoulders of giants. Um, and it, it's essential that we are uh, really interpreting and, and bringing context to other research as well. That's one of the, the critical things that we do as peer reviewers. Um, and also, uh, the other really critical thing that peer review brings to, to science and to research that it doesn't really exist in any other industries is that is an immense level of trust and an ability to trust what we read and publish literature. That's incredibly important. And you'll find that this is accepted throughout um, the academy, the funders, and everywhere. Here's a quote from um, uh, the Hefke Metric Tide Report, which is basically the UK government's um, uh, funding arm, uh, analyzing the way that they uh, hand out funding um, to, to, to institutions, really saying that peer review is still a primary basis for evaluating research. Um, it was an interesting report. It came out yesterday, and of course, I'm obliged. Um, I wrote a post-publication review on it, so you can follow that link and read it on Publons. Um, so, of course, everybody says that peer review is important and we need to be recognizing it, but you wouldn't know it from the way the world works today. There's a screenshot here of the, the Times Higher Ed World University Rankings. If you go in and look through the World University Rankings, you can see they look at things like teaching, um, research, so citations and the journals that you publish in, um, patents and that sort of thing. But there is zero mention of peer review in any of this stuff. It's very much a business as usual sort of thing. And that's what we see through all of the areas of research where funding flows. Um, everybody says that peer review is essential. But, but nobody actually recognizes that with funding. Mm -hmm. So the net result is that as a researcher, while peer review is essential, um, really all you face is a massive pressure to publish. 
with really little incentive to review. And that results in all sorts of uh, problems in the industry. So we're seeing massive increases of submissions, um, lots more rejections of articles. Um, and because of the pressure to publish, we're actually starting to see more and more instances of review of fraud. So while this is a small problem, I think it's a symptom of an underlying issue, which is the pressure to publish. On the flip side, as a reviewer, um, it actually takes a long time to do a review. Um, the process is quite slow, and you're asked many, many times every year to review, and that can be quite fatiguing. So really, I think one of the goals that we should be working on here as, a, as an industry um, is to bring some balance back to this process, uh, bring the system back to an equilibrium. And it seems to, seems to us at Pavlons really that by recognizing review and turning into something that's a measurable research output, that's the way to make that happen. So quick, uh, quick introduction to how you can get recognition for your reviews today. So with Pavlons, you have an online prof profile. Here is an example um, of a researcher, Stephen Roberts, from the University of Washington. You can see um, he's connected with his orchid here, and he's a reviewer for a number of different journals. If you look towards the bottom of his profile, you can see um, green ticks beside each of the reviews that he's done. So that means that Publons has been able to verify um, across many different publishers the reviews that he's done. So the nice result of this um, is that these are a couple of my favorite tweets. Steve actually tweeted out saying, it's actually uh, a lot easier to spend some time on a manuscript knowing that I'm actually getting some credit. And um, actually, just the very fact that we're acknowledging this, this activity and bringing some awareness to it um, actually results in more constructive reviews. The other thing I want to highlight about this is on the bottom right there. Uh, this is a, a verbatim quote from a researcher. Uh, this year, I will be evaluated by my institution. Um, and one of the documents um, I'm going to use is my Publons profile to show my peer review activity, verified peer review activity. So there's two things you need to know about Publons. Um, first is that there are two really simple ways to add reviews. You can add a review just by emailing it to reviews at publons.com, um, or you can use one of our many uh, publisher or journal integrations to automatically add reviews. Um, once you've added your reviews, you, uh, there's two clicks, and you'll be able to download a record of your verified contributions. Here's an example of mine. Um, it doesn't look that great in a PowerPoint, but it looks excellent on your CV. Um, and uh, I just wanted to highlight um, a researcher, Matthias Lean, who um, actually used this uh, download or downloadable report um, as part of his promotion application. And the feedback that he got was it really helped him to stand out, um, the fact that he could verify all of the peer review activity he had been doing. So it's really cool to see this um, recognition start to flow from the fact that we're able to measure peer review outputs. Um, I mentioned journal integrations. We partner with um, many of the top publishers in the world, in fact, four of the top seven. Um, that's Springer Nature, Wiley Sage, Cambridge University Press, and many others, including the first uh, publisher ever to run a peer review process, the Royal Society. Between all of these partners, more than 1,000 journals will be um, integrated into Publons during 2016. So really, there's a very good chance that a journal that you are reviewing or publishing for will be using Publons. And so then it will be uh, one click to opt-in, and recognition will automatically appear on your profile. Um, who's using the system? There are about 80,000 different uh, reviewers. We've added nearly half a million reviews now across basically every journal in the world, um, adding thousands of reviews every week. And our headline stat for 2015 for last year is uh, a little bit more than 1% of all the reviews that were performed in 2015 were added to Publons during that year. Of course, this year it will be quite a bit more. Um, so that's how you can get recognition now. That all works and is great, but I think the exciting thing that I want to talk about um, here in this, in this uh, seminar is about building the future of peer review. Um, I really think that where we've got to with recognition is baby steps, and um, there are all sorts of exciting things we can start to do in the future to build on this. Um, so what is the future going to look like? I think that the future is going to be um, uh, much more like what we see on the internet. Um, it's a little known fact, but Publons was originally founded to be peer reviewed for the archive, the preprint server. Um, 
but we really figured out that um, recognition has to be at the, the base of all of these things, and we've been focusing heavily on that. But I think what you'll see, start to see in the future is that um, things like preprint servers and, and other various networks will start to play a more and more important role. Um, we'll see much more open review, and much more flexibility around the way review is done. And then really as awareness and recognition grows, I expect we'll start to see um, people taking a lot of, um, putting a lot of effort into the craftsmanship and the way that they do their reviews, um, really turning into something that's a, a, something that you want to read in its own right. A great review is very useful, a good way to see, um, to understand and bring context to an article. But the key point I want to make is that none of these things are going to happen unless it's built on a solid foundation of recognition. Um, so I'm really keen to see what, in the rest of the seminar, um, all of the other presenters um, are, are working on. Uh, just quickly, I'll run through three things that that we are working with on, on Publons and looking towards the future you might be interested in. Um, the first one is post-publication review. As I said, uh, we supported post-publication review from, from the very first day we wrote code for Publons. Um, just quickly walk you, through how, walk you through how that works. So you can just put a, a DOI into the Publons um, search bar and import really any article from around the web. Um, within seconds, you'll be able to start writing a post-publication review. You can choose whether you want to sign your name to this or you want to do it as a blind review. And of course, in both cases, this is one of the key things about Publons, uh, whether blind or, or, or open, you still get recognition on your profile. Um, so as you can see, there is a my metric tied post-publication review. Uh, DOI has been minted, and it's available there for, for the world to read. It's a very easy process. The nice thing then is, um, although the vast majority of reviews on Publons are pre-publication reviews, there are actually thousands of post-publication reviews you can, you can jump in and read. It's easy to browse and search for them on Publons. The other interesting thing that I want to show there is you can actually check how um, each of these articles uh, is getting attention around the web with um, the altmetric badge just embedded there. So that's one thing. Second thing is um, looking beyond just measuring review quantity and looking at other ways to, to, to measure the quality or um, look, at, look for reviewers who are doing outstanding reviews. So we actually talk a lot to editors. They're one of our key stakeholders at Publons. We ask them what makes a good peer review. And the thing that stands out is really um, clarity, thoroughness, helpfulness, and, and professionalism. Um, these are the things that editors look for in a reviewer. Um, I'm not going to talk about it too much today, but we actually have um, a way now for editors to be recognized for the manuscripts that they're handling. And as part of that process, um, there's actually a rating and feedback form that they can complete. How clear was this review? How helpful was this review? How thorough was it? And how timely was it? Um, these, these scores aren't actually shown on your profile. Um, and we also have a, a section where you can add some the editor can add some constructive feedback to help you as a reviewer to improve your performance, and again, that's kept completely private to you. But what, they, what we do do is on your profile, if you do an outstanding review as evaluated by the editor, we'll highlight it with a star and really pull it out as an exceptional review. So moving to, to a future where it's not just the quantity of work you do, but really how helpful and thorough and good your reviews are. Um, finally, the other bit of feedback we get, particularly from early career researchers, so it's quite, quite onerous or, or scary to get into the business of review, and it's quite hard to be discovered by editors. So we have a lot of people that sign up to Publons and don't really have a way to get started with peer review. So one of the things we're working on is what we're calling um, the Publons Academy, a way for you as an early career researcher to work with your supervisor and participating editors to learn how to review um, to use some of the Publons platform to practice reviewing, and then as a graduate of the Publons Academy, uh, be, become available to editors as um, someone who is an expert in your field um, and also someone who is capable of reviewing. So really looking at expanding the pool of available reviewers outside of the, the traditional pool that we use. Um, 
So this is actually open for early enrollments now. So if you go to publons.com, you'll be able to find the, the Publons Academy. Um, and uh, very soon we'll be announcing um, the course and who will be participating from prestigious reviewers and editors all the way through to Nobel Prize winners. So I'd encourage you if you are interested in review and interested in recognition in the future of review to check that out. Um, and that is me from Publons. Okay, so I hope that everybody can hear me okay. My name is Katie Ridd. I'm a team manager and senior editor at Nature Communications. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at NatureComs. You can also follow me, but I'm not quite so prolific as Nature Communications. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, recognizing peer review and the peer review process from a publisher's point of view. Um, so, but first, a little about me. So, at Nature and the Nature Research Journals, um, we are full-time editors. I have a PhD um, in sort of cellular in vitro toxicology, and some, um, and maybe most, but not all editors also have some postdoctoral experience. So I completed uh, two postdoctoral positions, uh, one in the UK and one in the, U uh, in the US. And so um, we all have um, you know, science experience. Um, I joined Nature Protocols in 2008 as a maternity cover whilst I was deciding where to go in my career. Um, I found it a really rewarding experience being an editor. I could work really hard and also um, you, know, you see the fruits of my labor at the end of the day. Um, and so I decided to stay in editorial. I moved to Nature Communications before it launched in 2009. Um, and it was a fantastic experience watching the journal grow and uh, the shaping of a new journal. Um, I wanted to mention a little bit about the peer review process and what that means um, at a publisher. And so in the orange boxes on the left hand side, we receive a new paper. Um, a new paper at Nature Communications can also be transferred to us from one of our sister journals. And so we make an editorial decision and we use those skills that I talked about from our PhDs and our postdocs about whether we think um, a particular paper is interesting, whether it passes at editorial threshold. Um, and depending on the field and the journal, about 60 to 80 percent of the papers are returned to the world. Those that we decide pass our editorial threshold, they enter peer review. And so this is where we invite the reviewers to comment on a paper. And I'll talk a little bit about um, how we select reviewers in my next slide. Once we've received our uh, report, we make an editorial decision. And by that, I mean that we discuss the reports that we receive. Um, we think about the experiments that um, reviewers have asked for, and we think about, do we require all of those um, to, to make the journal satisfactory, the paper satisfactory for our journal? So once we make that editorial decision, there are uh, four boxes uh, in green on the right-hand side of the screen, and so we can accept a paper. This is rare after one round of review, but it does happen for some papers and those that we receive that have been transferred and they can review at another term. Uh, we can ask authors to revise their paper, and here we're thinking more about some more minor experiments that might just need to tie up some loose ends. We also have, um, we can invite authors to revise as well, but we've all made revisions where they need to go away and spend some more time on their study. And in some cases, um, it's deemed that the paper isn't acceptable to us and it would be rejected. So you can see for the revised boxes that this means the paper is going to go, undergo another round of peer review. And so once again, we're asking our reviewers to help us out. 
So I mentioned that I would talk a little bit about how we choose uh, referees, and Andrew mentioned this a little bit in his talk um, about um, how, how we pick people. Um, so we are looking for people with experience in the field. Um, so we will invite uh, people that we know and um, publish widely in a particular area. Um, some of those reviewers will say to us, um, I would like to review with my postdoc. So sort of talked a little bit about what Andrew was talking about with his postdoc academy, giving some um, newer people um, some, some experience here. But these people are also reviewing with their uh, principal investigator. We look for some reviewers that have what we would think of as a technical expertise. We're looking for somebody with um, experience in a particular method that has been applied. Sometimes um, the reviewers that we have will suggest their postdoc for this because they are the people that are doing these experiments. Um, we are looking for people that can provide us a broad overview of current trends and important issues in a particular topic. There may be some controversies within the field that um, we would need to, to know about and, and the, the reviewers often have a broad view of these. Um, efficient, we ask for a 10 day turnaround. Well, um, we're quite happy to extend these deadlines. We appreciate that reviewers are very busy and they quite often want to help us, but they need a little bit more time. Um, we like to um, use people that we know that are thorough and also um, provide us with two point reports and those that are fair-minded and constructive. But as Andrew mentioned, um, you know, we are always looking to expand our reviewer report because we do appreciate that this is time consuming for everybody. Um, so a little bit about how our decisions are made in the peer review process. Um, we don't count votes, um, so we may have three reviewers on a paper and two of them may be happy and one with a particular key area of expertise may tell us that there are fundamental problems in the paper um, and if it's a key area of expertise we have to think carefully about how we make our decision. Um, as I mentioned before, most papers go through two rounds of review. Um, for those decisions which we consider to be borderline, this may be between a major revision and a revise, we are thinking about avoiding multiple rounds of review, both for authors, the editors, and also thinking about the reviewers. Um, if we do consider a work to be of interest, we will, uh, we will send these major revised decisions, and we can wait for um, papers to be revised. Um, So uh, we're thinking about ways of recognizing reviewers' efforts. So a number of journals are offering what we call transparent peer review these days. And so we rolled this out with Nature Communications in 2016. And so for all papers that were submitted in 2016 and are accepted, we ask our authors if they would like to publish the peer review reports. Um, so what we would see um, in our online um, papers, there would be the peer review reports and then also the, review, the author's response to those reports and we would see how many rounds of review that paper had, had gone through. There are other um, publishers that have been doing this for, for longer than us and so the idea is that we can show what the discussion has been during peer review. Um, we think that it might be useful for students so they can see how the peer review process goes. Um, we've also um, you know, encouraged reviewers to sign their report. There are um, particular areas, uh, namely ecology, where reviewers are actually quite keen to sign their reports. So if you sign your report and the paper is published with transparent peer review, then the readers will see who the reviewer was that, uh, that reviewed the paper. Um, we also um, acknowledge um, reviews um, within the, um, the journals at Nature and um, Nature Research. Um, and so we have been offering um, some rewards to our uh, frequent reviewers. Um, we also um, want to, uh, other publishers are promoting discussion of review reports prior to decisions. So Elife and Embo do this where they share the reviewer reports between the reviewers before they make them. Um, Nature has been involved in a trial about publishing the reviewers' identities, 
And so at the point of acceptance, the authors will ask if they wish to learn the names of the reviewers. The reviewers also have to consent to the authors learning about them, and this will be published at the end of the paper. Or we can say that we thank the um, reviewer and name them, and any other anonymous reviewers that didn't wish to be named. So if we're thinking about um, continuing discussion after review, and Andrew talked a little bit about this, um, so we have um, informal ways of, of discussing papers after review. So um, we have commenting functions online that people can use. Um, have, you know, discussions that have already sort of been ongoing and are ongoing from publishing the review reports and the rebuttal letters. There are more formal ways of continuing discussion after review. So in nature they have brief communications at the rising section. So this is usually where um, a central point of the paper is challenged by a reader. Um, at Nature Communications, we use the correspondence um, title, and so these aren't necessarily where the, uh, a central conclusion of the paper is challenged, but it's an interesting um, further discussion of the paper and it's an important point. Um, there are also external sites um, where we have discussion continuing after review, such as F1000 and Hublons, as Andrew mentioned. So where are we going and what is the road ahead? So there's the possibility of portable peer review, and so that is where a paper is reviewed at one journal um, and for um, editorial reasons is um, not deemed a publication, and then those reports can get transferred to another um, another journal and another publisher. So an example of this is an agreement with a neuroscience consortium where uh, reviewers can be um, can be shared. And we also see this within our funding when people transfer papers to us. We see the reviewers' reports and papers that are transferred to Nature Communications and it enables us to make a decision. Um, open review, so this is um, a, a different journals are trialing this where they have, um, where they either publish um, all versions of the paper that has been with them, where they, um, where they can also um, have an um, open and closed review at the same time, so they can have um, uh, people commenting on a paper whilst it is under closed formal peer review. Um, so Andrew uh, mentioned DOIs um, for the reports from Publons. This is another important way of recognising reviewers' efforts. Um, and sort of thinking about more open uh, review, Andrew also mentioned the use of preprint servers. And so in the physics, physical sciences world with archive, this has been around for a long time where uh, people will post their papers um, pre-publication and make the comments from the community. And more recently we have the uh, bioarchive, which um, I see in the biological sciences gaining more traction. And then there are also uh, numerous other preprint servers that have emerged in the recent And so I think that was all I wanted to say from a publisher's uh, perspective and I'm happy to take questions at the end. Hello there. Here is Alexander from Papenheim. I hope you can see my screen right now. Yes, seems so. Just going into the pool view. All right. Ah. Right. So, um, just see if you have some problem with the, ah, sorry, well then, just, just setting it up then. Uh, my name is Alexander and I'm the co-founder of Paperhive. I'm glad to, to be here uh, and talk about Paperhive and our role in, um, well, in peer review. Uh, just two words, a few words about me. Um, I have a background in business and IT uh, with focus on educational data mining, um, Cooperation systems and human and um, human uh, and human computer interaction. Um, before joining Paperhive, um, I have been active in establishing social entrepreneurship communities around Europe. 
before moving to um, the focus points, the areas where paper hype is relevant uh, in terms of fostering peer review and recognition for peer review, I'll just introduce with a few sentences our platform. It is an, quite a new tool uh, that we um, released just three and a half months ago. Baden Hive is a platform for collaborative reading. This is a new concept that aims at introducing interaction, aims at introducing communication in the process mm -hmm. of reading. Um, while researchers are still doing their, like, still generating their ideas and insights for their own work. Baden Hive is a cross-publisher layer of interaction, independent of uh, the um, publisher or general where the content comes from. From So you're enabling in-document discussions on books and articles and all the rich media annotations um, are there to increase the value and impact of documents to keep them alive. So basically the researchers using paper hype uh, create a web of interconnected knowledge. The applications, the applications range from interactive lectures and seminars to the work of research groups. So today are the two main points where I would like to um, put an emphasis on are uh, research and innovation as works and as work in progress and research and innovation as chain reactions of collaboration. These are two dimensions of peer review and I'll be glad to hear your opinion about our view of them after the presentation. So the three main important di dimensions of peer review, or if you want to put it, uh, where does uh, peer review really have to take care of, uh, care of uh, obviously filtering of uh, research, uh, taking care for uh, its reliability, is it high quality research or, or not? And the third dimension, also very important, the improvement of research. So basically, with peer review, the, the system, the ecosystem of researchers in different communities try to save researchers time to increase the quality, to improve the quality. Though these goals are prioritized in a different way across disciplines. This is one of the reasons why we do have different approaches in different fields of um, of science. This is why, for example, physicists and mathematicians uh, have archived. This is why, for example, language uh, science research communities uh, are very active in post-publication PhD. So, how does paper hive make a difference? Where do we try to be uh, of help to both researchers and uh, well, journal editors? First and foremost, it's the improvement part. We believe that continuous improvement and updating of research is a major topic. One of the reasons is that there is a lot of new research. Um, so having in mind all of this, there's a necessity for continuous conversation around the research work. Secondly, peer review education. Um, it's a proven fact that um, researchers, especially young ones who do not yet have experience in reviewing, either need a formal education or at least some way to get into the process of evaluating and improving others' work. So we believe research and innovation are chain reactions of collaboration. To begin with, um, work in progress. Um, as, it, as it is, once, once evaluated and once um, admitted to, um, to the formal scientific literature, a piece of research uh, usually stays, um, stays there to be evaluated by only citations um, and, of course, mentions and then further work. Though this may take time and this can also mean that a lot is missed out. In a way, having only one research board, one editorial board, 
um, and only a few peer reviewers, they have um, evaluating if something is, um, is valid and high quality research once in time is not enough um, for continuous life or the continuous life of a research document. So as soon as time is passed, this one single valuation needs to be updated. The research and innovation works are work in progress. Therefore, to uh, our system, obviously other uh, approaches, research can be updated, enriched, improved, kept alive. How Paperhive does this is, for example, through the uh, to making community proofreading and open post-publication peer review possible. What you would see in, on your screens right now is an example of a uh, of a book in uh, language science uh, published, in, I believe, in Berlin. Uh, and there is some some commentary in the right mm -hmm. margin, which um, is is actually made possible to an active community of language researchers who once again after something has been publi published, after this book has been published, go into the process of updating it, of enriching it, enriching it. This the document is kept alive, there is new valuable information for both further readers and for the author themselves who, who might in a further revision uh, just improve their, their research work. So basically, one of the added benefits of this uh, this approach is improving the idea, of, like heightening the idea of um, research peer review, not only as a way to, to stop something, not only as a, as a gatekeeper, but as a way to improve. Every annotation in our platform increases the value and in, impact of content for all readers. All those uh, annotations, discussions that you saw on the book before um, that I showed, they're all citable, archived, they're, and archived. They're licensed under the Creative Commons and uh, the, the standard, they, they follow the technical standard is um, according to the W3C web annotation standards which are still in development. So we believe that this way of um, well, informal at this point, but inherent recognition can foster this communication, can channel all this relevant communication back, back to the original texts, giving the, the proper recognition of all those who, are in the process of reading, um, do reviews, basically. In, in the right margin, there's also one small box which says read and, read and discuss on paper hype. This is an embeddable widget that publishers and journals can integrate with their uh, websites so that um, a reader starting there can see, okay, there's, a new, there's news, uh, there's something new, there's an, uh, new information about this content that's probably updated or more relevant or there's just another connection to something else I should read. The second part um, I wanted to accent on was um, that research and innovation are chain reactions of collaboration. So improving research does not stop, enriching it does not stop. And this is the way where we should think also about education in peer review. The quote, you, the quote, you're, seeing, um, the quote you're seeing on the slide uh, that uh, approximately two-thirds of authors and uh, humanities, social sciences, and STM um, would like to enjoy some formal training in peer review or in review uh, is, well, obviously a, an evidence that both the academy presented by Andrew from Pablons or the other ways of helping young researchers to go to the field of reviewing uh, is very important. It is crucial. Uh, what we are trying to do is, well, basically mm, embedding both communication and reviewing in the process of reading itself. So while a researcher, no matter what their discipline is doing the reading, they get the chance to interact with others, to communicate, communicate with them, and to review without having the, um, well, the fear of doing something wrong. 
no matter the correction would be just a correction of a simple typo or, or a question that sometimes might not be the um, most important one. All this is just lowering the barrier for researchers, especially young ones, to move into the process of reviewing, of critically reading. This is what we are achieving with um, enabling communication, conversations in the margin of documents. Um, so, thank you very much for, for your time. Um, I believe that um, this is most um, well, this is the most important part where paper health can be helpful to fostering um, peer review, improving it, and fostering recognition is by basically um, emphasizing the continuous aspect of, of, of research, um, the fact that research articles shipped in books um, are living documents. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. This is Stephanie Dawson from Science Open, and I just really want to first take a moment to say thanks so much to Andrew and Katie and Alexander for joining us. Uh, also in this whoops, uh, uh, webinar to talk about the future of peer review and recognition for reviewers. Um, so let me get started. I wanted to talk about peer review in context. So I think peer review week which I really like and um, was uh, deeply involved in last year and this year, provides us really with the opportunity to take a step back and ask, what should peer review accomplish? And I think this question is being asked a lot these days. Um, when I started out in this business, uh, I'm not going to say how many years ago, <laughs> but we were putting manuscripts into envelopes and mailing them to Japan and Brazil we weren't really asking what are we trying to accomplish with the peer review that we're doing. But the next generation digital technology is forcing us to really think about what are the essential features of peer review and which of those do we need really to um, move forward. So uh, I think for me, and I, this is what I've also heard from the talks today, um, is that one of the really most important um, points of peer review is really validation of results um, and endorsement uh, for, the, uh, for the research community. And as Alexander just said um, from PaperHive, it's really important for filtering to save time and for reliability for quality. So we are using peer review a lot as a, a shortcut for search and discovery. It saves us time and resources. We know this has been vetted, um, this research, and we can um, go ahead and use it. And that is being currently, um, for the most part, managed by journal brands. Um, and those journal brands also give us a kind of a gut feeling, OK, I know this journal I can really trust. Oh, I um, have published there before. Um, we should always also keep in mind that the journals have, um, uh, yeah, are f mostly for-profit entities. They need to support all of their activities, um, and the different models have different economic implications. So there's really um, a certain economics of selectivity that uh, subscription journals use that are very different from the economics of open access. Um, but there is. Um, that going on behind uh, behind the scenes. And right now, we really are using very much the journal at a journal level um, to manage this validation. I would really like to, from a platform level, think about can we reimagine the results of peer review on a more granular scale, on an article level? So there are from the STM report, let's just say 2.5 million articles published per year 
even if those only had two reviewer reports. That would be five million reports. And we already heard from Katie that those are going through multiple reports and 60% are being rejected and going on to the next journal where they get two other um, review reports. So uh, the five to 10 million review reports is probably even a little bit low. Um, so could we really, that's, a lot of information out there. Couldn't we use that information that's generated by peer review to learn more about a research topic and to also fulfill those goals that we talked about, filtering reliability in a maybe a more um, yeah, digital way. So if we had open review with the researchers full publication history and we hear that's coming more and more um, in to the mainstream as it's the easiest way to give researchers recognition for their work. Um, if we had post-publication evaluation of the results um, for those that where we don't have any access to the pre-publication, you know, sort of collaborative discussion that goes on, then we could really use that to understand the context of research more. We could use it as an interpretation system, and I really like that what Andrew said, um, that part of the researcher's job really is this interpretation of research results and seeing peer review in the context really of interpretation um, is an interesting way to think about it. And then we could build um, better author and reviewer reputation systems that would feed back into learning more for the entire scientific community, learning more about a specific um, research topic. So on Science Open, just to give a, a, a short yeah, um, demonstration of what we're doing here, we um, do offer on 25 million article records on our site, open um, the possibility to do a, an open post-publication peer review um, with your own name, linked to your ORCID, um, uh, with a Crossref DOI that you can add to your CV, add to your ORCID profile, add to Publons, add to whatever um, platform you're using, just in order to really start giving researchers that kind of um, recognition. But I would like to take just a moment since we are um, since I'm the last one at the <laughs> at the end of this webinar and think a little bit also farther down the road. So what is really the future of um, peer review? Uh, some of the new developments may uh, look a lot different uh, than how we know it today. Um, so somebody really mentioned the rise of um, preprint um, pre servers. I would even say I would even include preprint publishing services um, such as the one Science Open offers that you can publish first and do an open peer review process. After um, F1000 Research is doing similar um, projects, Rio. Um, so there is a lot of uh, interest in making that whole process more open, more networked from the very beginning. And I think just this preprint um, issue will push the whole system towards a more open um, uh, and networked peer reviewing. I think what's also very, what's going on that's also very interesting is um, the different ways in which uh, platforms are using text and data mining um, to analyze citations within the text to be able to say what are people really discussing in a, in a paper. And isn't that also a kind of peer review? So if I can um, uh, extract a sentence that says, you know, the methods used in this paper were a great help or we based our next project on this. If I can take that sentence and put that, um, uh, attach that to the citation information, I can really start understanding more about the paper that I'm reading and who's doing a better job really of testing reproducibility, um, working with those research results than the uh, researcher who's building their um, next paper on top of that. So it takes longer, but citation um, information could be 
a very powerful tool, um, uh, a very powerful kind of peer review if we start um, looking at it that way. I also like a lot of the work that's going on in creating article level identifiers such as um, PRE, such as the um, Open Science Center identifiers at the article level to say what kind of peer review has this article gone through. Because I think what we're seeing also via um, uh, new big amounts of data coming in, mega journals, we're really seeing um, the journal management of peer review being broken down on a, to a more granular level. Um, and when Science Open adds all of the Cielo database, now we're up to 25 million articles on the Science Open site. Um, that brings in a lot of journals that I don't know about, authors that I'm not familiar with. All of that, we really need to find new ways to bring it down to an article level. Is this article relevant to me? Um, because the context of the journal is maybe um, losing importance for the individual user. Also, thinking about really publishing data with every paper, publishing codes so that people can test the reproducibility right at that very moment of reading is um, another thing where I think we're going to also start seeing more of the kind of collaborative um, commenting annotation that um, PaperHive is uh, making possible on their site. So I think there's a lot of new uh, products out there and new ideas out there that take the idea of, uh, that take the idea of, of peer review sort of to the next, always with the idea of keeping in mind what do we want from um, peer review. So we really want to have, we want to understand in an individual article, what's the context of that? How much can I trust this article? And we're going to want to uh, be able to sort and find and filter in a fast way um, uh, that kind of trustable information. So this is what we are trying to do on Science Open. Um, here's an example of an article page. We really try and um, show up citations. We use the altmetric score, comments, post-publication, peer review, link authors um, and citations, link back to the uh, version of record on the publisher site, um, in really in order to be a good tool for researchers to find um, trustable information. Um, and here's just an example of the kind of context-driven search and discovery that we can do on Science Open, and we will continue to de develop that with partners from across the industry to really aggregate information in order to make that more um, available for researchers. And at the same time, we should always keep in mind how can we um, uh, give recognition then back to the research community who is actually doing um, doing all the hard work of interpreting these results. So just to sum up uh, what Science Open is doing as an aggregator of information, we really um, will continue to open up and explore the context of scholarly research um, and in order really to support and recognize peer review in all of its forms, in all of its forms, be that text and data mining, be that open reports, be that um, uh, signed reports that are closed, etc. I think there's a lot of different ways that we can start trying to bring all of that content together. So that's it. Uh, that's it from from me from Science Open, and I'm happy to turn this back over to John. Thanks. All right. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to ask all of the panelists to share their webcams now, and we're going to uh, open it up for some discussion. I had quite a lot of questions asked on the uh, on the questions tab, shockingly, um, and yeah, it'd be great to hear some of them from people. Uh, I'll ask them. I guess. Where is everyone? <laughs> okay, well, uh, the webcams don't seem to be working right now. At least I 
can't see them anyway. I'll just turn that off. So um, I guess one of the first questions which we had asked was, how can we reward for quality instead of quantity? Um, I wonder if, Andrew, you could uh, start with that one. Maybe. Yeah, it's a really good question. Sorry, getting a little bit of feedback here. I'm just going to put on some headphones. Can you can you hear me, all right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Um, so the way I see it, um, quality is absolutely critical. Um, you, you could do a hundred peer reviews that are two words long. It's not very useful to anybody. Um, so just measuring quantity is, of course, not ideal. The challenge is, is that I think that being able to measure peer review in any form at all is really has to be the first step. Um, it's only once you can measure it that you can do something useful with it. Um, so I think really that's the probably still today really where the focus has to be, um, working on the infrastructure to, to get peer review um, into a form that we can start to think about measuring forms of quality. The question then is what sort of quality do you do you look at? So an obvious one would be what the length of the review, how long it took to do the review. Um, kind of the sorts of metrics that are easy to measure. And I think that we have to be careful as we start talking about quality um, that we don't just focus on the things that are easy to measure. I think that's a trap that would be very easy to fall into. Um, so obviously this is something we've spent a lot of time, we Publons have spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, and really the way that we look at it is it's it's got to come out of the network. So it really has to be a combination of the hard metrics like the length of time it takes to do a review, maybe the length of the review itself, but that really has to be a small part of the whole measure of quality. So the thing that keeps coming, it keeps coming back to for us is um, what does the editor think of the review? Was it helpful? What does the author think of the review? Did it help me to improve my, improve my manuscript? Um, potentially also what did the other reviewers um, think, from, think of the review? Um, really the experts, the people who, who kind of understand the paper the best, what is their opinion of the review? So I think that's got to play an important role in, in the future of quality measures and it's kind of the way we're thinking about it. Um, the challenge of course is um, with all of these things incentivizing or giving people a reason to want to weigh in on the quality of review. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's the, going to be the big challenge and it's kind of the thing that we're working on pretty hard with our editor recognition um, uh, service, so giving editors some recognition for reviewing, uh, but I think there's a long way to go on the, on the quality front. All right, great, great, great answer. Thanks for that, Andrew. Um, so the next question is, uh, are post-publication peer reviews moderated, and can they, or, or might they have an adverse effect on impact, uh, an adverse impact on tarnishing the reputations of researchers? So, uh, Alexander, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, sorry, could you, could you uh, repeat the first part of your question? Didn't hear yeah, me sorry. Completely. Yep. Um, are post-publication peer reviews moderated in any way? Um, I guess this includes annotations. And might they have an adverse impact on tarnishing the reputation of researchers? Great, great question. Thanks to, for giving it to me. Um, there are two types of moderation that you can uh, usually, that you usually have. One of them is uh, very importantly a um, something like community moderation. The example I gave in my presentation um, comes from a very active language community, language research community, um, based in Germany, not, not only. Um, and the people there, in fact, know each other. I'm not sure if there are a few hundreds or a few thousands, but in a way, they're actively communicating. And this helps to have this inherent moderation. Uh, so this is one of the ways to look at it, so it's automatic in a way. The second part is more of a technical moderation. Uh, we ourselves at PaperHive, uh, we have our roots in the open source um, programming community, so uh, we're often inspired by uh, platforms as, or communities as Stack Overflow or GitHub. And there you have also some sort of um, automatic community moderation with up, upvoting, downvoting of quality uh, or, well, low quality 
uh, opinions and answers. So this definitely helps to um, well point out point out what is good and what is uh, what is bad. Um, it naturally has a somewhat adverse um, or somewhat restricting effect on the quantity of opinions. But I guess this is uh, something we are fine with in research, obviously. So opinions that are thoughtful, answers that are, or questions that are uh, well considered. Um, and then the last step to, to, to sum up, having in mind that you have this continuous mode of interacting, this continuous conversation, uh, it changes the perception of uh, reviewing and giving feedback and evaluations as something that is only once done and that's it. By changing this, people are more inclined to, to communicate and to basically take the risk to, uh, well, to state that something is uh, as they see it, if it's good or, or bad. All right, thank you, Alexa. Um, Stephanie, do you have anything to add to that one by any chance? Yeah, I would just like to weigh in um, just because I think it's important that uh, what Science Open did for um, to protect the researchers, I mean, you can't moderate every discussion of their paper, but asking people to do it with their own names attached to their ORCID ID, then I think you can increase the level of civility in the whole process. So um, the hope was that uh, if somebody, you know, trashes a paper, you can go and look at their publication record and see do they have the expertise to actually say that? Is that a reasonable thing to say? Um, and I think some kind of like, um, like you said, Alexander, some kind of like upvoting, downvoting is helpful. But just having people be able to having people do that with their own names, I think, is uh, first great to get recognition for peer reviewers, and on the other hand, um, can prevent that kind of um, misuse of the system. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so the next question I'm going to target at Amy, uh, Katie. Sorry. <laughs> How can we internally evaluate referees, and do blacklists exist for poor quality reviewers, and are they used? Um, so uh, we don't have a blacklist for poor quality reviewers. Um, it was interesting what Andrew talked about in terms of I'm not sure we can always think about how long the report is, about whether it's good quality or not. Um, papers get submitted to us that have clearly been reviewed somewhere else because they come to us in pretty good shape. And so some of our reviewers might not write very long reports on those types of papers, but that's because the paper in general is pretty good. Um, so in, internally, about, it's, really, it's really difficult. And so you know, reviewers write different things on different Papers. You know, we have reviewers that we can use um, multiple times and they don't write such long reports on one paper as they do on another. Again, because I'm saying, you know, these papers are differing in quality, so they have different problems. Um, but uh, and I think it's, it's really different, difficult because I think it's, sometimes it can be a little bit subjective about how good a report is or not. Um, so the idea about the transparent peer review is the hope that you know, if we are going to publish these reports, then reviewers will, you know, maybe um, spend more time, or um, you know, the idea of about being more fair, or, or, or maybe more constructive is the better word. Um, that's kind of what we're hoping for the transparent peer review. Mm -hmm. I hope I hope we answered your question. Yeah, that's that's really useful. Thanks, Katie. Um, okay, so the next question I'm going to leave open to anyone. Um, should peer review be either financially rewarded or incentivized? Um, does anyone want to weigh in on that one? Nope. Yeah, I, I, can, I can weigh in there. Um, we think about this a lot. I think absolutely peer review should be incentivized. There's no doubt about that. That's kind of, I think, what we're talking about when we talk about recognizing review. It's really about giving you an incentive to want to do more of you. I think it's, they're kind of almost synonyms. Um, the question of whether peer review should be paid is a little bit trickier. I think one of the issues is that probably 
most researchers are already paid to do peer review and to publish articles and that sort of thing. That's kind of what you do as, as, a, as, you, as part of your job at a research institution, right? You're kind of paid to provide these services to the community and these sorts of things. The challenge historically has been tying what you do as an editor, as a reviewer, and as an author um, back to your performance within your institution. So I think that on the one hand, these things kind of are paid a little bit. Uh, but on the other hand, certainly incentive, providing additional incentives could um, be beneficial. Um, the flip side is that they do distort the way people behave. Monetary payments can tend to distort the way um, people behave. I think to really see a big impact on, um, on the speed of review or the quality of review, you'd be looking at paying quite a bit of money, um, probably more than and it would be sustainable for the whole process. So that's kind of my thoughts. Yeah, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. Right now, nobody gets paid for the articles that they publish, right? They basically ask, and what they get in return is reputation. And to be able to translate that system into the peer review process, say, we, you know, nobody's getting, people aren't getting money for that, but to actually get some kind of reputation back, I think is um, absolutely essential as probably the best in incentive you could offer to peer reviewers. I would completely agree uh, that um, incentivizing by awarding somebody with money would uh, be, first of all, detrimental to the ecosystem. Uh, if we try to establish it entirely. Secondly, it would definitely not work for all communities or all research fields. There might be some, you know, don't know which one, but they're very different themselves. Say in this uh, community I mentioned, it's a relatively small one, so how would you, how would you do that? Um, to just create some interesting disbalance among the people that in a way know themselves, and know each other, and just the main motivation, this is from, from the same report I, I quoted, um, this is a report by Italian and Francis from last year about peer review. Uh, the main motivation for, for researchers to review um, are around the fact to give something back to the community and to be part of the community, to reciprocate what you've, what's already been done to you in a good way. So if you put money inside in the game, this will distort quite a few incentives. And how would you measure if a review in mathematics is as worthy as, say, a review in, I don't know, medicine? All right. Thanks, everyone. It's uh, really, really interesting stuff. Um, so I'm going to open up another question. So how can we get peer reviews to be accepted by universities and funders as a legitimate measure of scholarship? Does anyone want to jump in on that? Um, I'll, say, I'll say one thing. It's got to be measurable, right? Mm -hmm. um, and once it's measurable, we can start to do all sorts of interesting things. So how do you measure peer review? <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, so uh, to me it's kind of obvious. You have to um, have some, some way of registering the record and verifying that you did a review, whether it's a blind review or an open review. Um, and at that point I'm basically just pitching pub once, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I think part of the problem is also um, the, the fact that so much peer review is uh, done anonymously um, behind closed doors. I mean, peer, Pavlons has started trying to, with this verified review, to open that up. But I think until now, nobody, until we start really moving into a into an transparent peer review um, space, do will funders, um, universities, even be able to see what that means, how, what people are really doing in that amount of time. So I think, you know, to sort of, um, to make it that value transparent, we have to make the object transparent. And if you just say, yes, yes, I um, peer reviewed, uh, this is, I think, not enough to really convince a, a, a university 
that this is something that takes a lot of time and is valuable to the entire community if you're not even sharing it with the entire community, right? There, there are some things to be said for a uh, blind review, and I, I wouldn't want to end up in a situation where um, anonymous reviewers who are providing a valuable contribution to the community aren't recognized. I think that's that's an important thing to 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 get straight. And just to just to give a stat, a little bit over ninety percent of all the reviews on PubLens are um, are blind reviews. So I think it. Um, it seems to be what the community wants as well. You can still pull out interesting derivative statistics. So, for example, we have a World University Rankings um, system on PubLens where you can see the top reviewing institutions. And, <laughs> and most of the, the top reviewing institutions come out of um, anonymous review. So, I think, while I personally am in favor of open review, I do think that we have a long way to go before that future is here where everything is open. I think you're right, but I think just the first steps have already been made. I mean, it's been a, the the past three years have seen huge move towards more transparency and peer review. And I think in part is really if you can put somebody told me that they did a review of a a book project, but it was 40 pages long. His review, um, and if you can put that in front of your um, department head and say, well, you know this. Is what uh, is what I did. Um, then I think you have uh, something more tangible than just saying, "Okay, check. I reviewed for this journal or for this publisher." So I I, I think I don't see um, I don't see anonymous peer review going away. I don't see that it's not valuable, and ninety percent is uh, quite a lot. But I still think the I still think that the the researchers who have gone out on a limb and made their um, peer review really open and transparent are the ones who are making it clear to everybody how much work goes into that. And uh, the, for, the ones to really start making that, you know, sort of, sort of tangible for everybody. Okay. Um, okay, thanks for that. So the next question is for Andrew again. Uh, could PubLens be used as a resource to find peer reviewers? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, the way I would frame that is that um, there are a few different stakeholders in the world of publishing articles and research. There's obviously the author, there's the reviewer, um, and then there's the editor. And I think that they all play a really important role in the thing. But one of I think one of the key learnings for PubLens over the last few years is that really editors are quite central in this, and I think editors will remain central, even if you picture a future where everything is post-publication review. There's still going to be an editorial component. So I really think that editors are a critical uh, player in the ecosystem and generally under-recognized. Um, so then when we start to think about editors, um, there's obviously the need for, I think, more recognition for editors. Um, but then we also look at tools to help editors to more efficiently manage and push the peer review process forward. And so within that context, I think finding reviewers is something that could be looked at. But I actually think it goes beyond that, is finding reviewers, is making sure that this reviewer is the right expert for what you're trying to do. Um, and then there's finding a way to actually contact the reviewer and then incentivize them or get them to want to do a review. So I think there's a whole stack of problems there that we're really interested in looking at. Um, but obviously you want to do it in a way that's good for the ecosystem as a whole. Mm -hmm. If I might add, um, so I talked a little bit about how the types of people that we choose to be with is, that it's, it's actually very time consuming as well per paper. One of the things that we spend a lot of time on, um, you know, selecting that right person, finding them, inviting them, getting them to agree to review and securing them. But finding that perfect person is the time I think uh, Science Open is also, I mean, as a search and discovery platform and really trying to um, uh, open up the context around, um, uh, around an article, we really also are trying to give editors, publishers, researchers tools to find who's most related to this 
article, who's citing this article, who's cited by this article, who's using this article, and to really sort of also um, provide that tools out there for um, finding reviewers. And we're not as uh, deeply linked in, like we're not going to provide you with an email address and hook you up directly with a reviewer, but um, as, a, as a search platform, I think there's a lot of um, tools on Science Open that can be really also used for that purpose. All right, thanks everyone for that. So the next question I'm going to leave open again to everyone. Uh, what role could machines play in uh, the future for actually performing peer review itself? Does anyone see that happening? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to take that. Um, first of all, machines themselves probably won't be enough to do all the all the high, high, highly complex work of uh, establishing where something is um, well, unique, worthy for reading among the mass of content that's out there. So probably won't be enough to improve, to have this role of improvement for peer review and people in peer review right now have. Uh, but a play, place where they, they can be very, very helpful is probably in um, all the research that is somehow involved with, uh, with statistics, with, uh, with data. Uh, this is one of the fields where uh, we seem to have some issues for one reason or another. Repro reproducibility is the, the key word here. And machines um, can be quite helpful there. Uh, just recently, I unfortunately cannot, um, cannot give, a, give a source. Uh, there was a, a, a huge survey on a massive amount of hundreds of thousands of uh, papers in psychology and uh, very smart algorithms run across them to check whether the um, results were statistically significant. So I believe um, computers will be a helpful tool for reviewers and editors to, in the future to check for validity and quality of research. I, I definitely agree. I think that um, if you look at things like scientific rigor there are some there are some ways to to uh, use semantic text mining to find out whether people f are um, doing certain kinds of experiments or certain kinds of um, controls in their experiments and a peer reviewer who has a checklist of you know 50 items that they're supposed to um, check there have been certain there have been experiments that have shown that peer reviewers are not very good at actually you know finding all of the mistakes in a in a in a paper so i think just to leave um just to leave that up to the human component is probably if you have these kind of powerful machine learning tools in the background um and not taking advantage of them would be a shame i think uh we will see um, people developing those kinds of support mechanisms. I don't see the I don't see the reviewer leaving the equation, um, but I do see I do see that we'll f we'll have many new ways to um, support them with machine yeah, learning. Yeah, I'd, I'd be re really interested in Katie's take on this actually. But just to quickly say, when I think about improving peer review, it's about building better tools. Some of those tools can be computer aided, obviously, but I do think there will always be a, a human component to stuff. Although, who knows where, where it's going to go? But just to call out two interesting projects that um, whoever asked this question, you may or may not be aware of. There's um, Penelope, um, which I think was started by James Harwood. It's a, kind of an interesting, um, I think, pre-submission or on-submission um, manuscript analysis tool. And then I think Daniel Shanahan over at um, BMC is doing some, some really interesting work on automated checks for peer review. So I think there will um, definitely be some, some developments. Uh, so I, I'm thinking about what Stephanie had mentioned, you know, people can't check everything and the mistakes sort of come into papers. So they work quite hard with people's and 
they have enough information that um, I think we have to get all this very good information. But what about information? Um, okay, the audio seems to have gone a little bit dodgy there. Sorry, Katie. Um, I'm just going to move on to the next question then. We've got about five minutes left, guys, so if you want to ask a question, do try and get it in now, and we'll try and get it done. Uh, just for now, though, um, how can peer review be used to show if an article is actually relevant or not to a researcher? Who wants to jump in on that? Maybe Stephanie? Sure. I mean, it's the kind of work that we're trying to do with Science Open. If we have, um, if we know who the peer re reviewer is, what's his, what's um, his scientific field, his publications, what's he reviewed before, we can use all of that information to basically um, in increase the amount of, uh, let's say, information around the article, and that will be able to help us to say, researcher, this is be particularly relevant to you. This maybe not so much. You know, it's a, it says it's a published in the Journal of Pediatrics and Cardiology, uh, Pediatric Cardiology, but uh, it's very much more dealing with one aspect or another aspect that's less relevant to you. So I think um, we can definitely use all of that context of the, um, the researcher in order to say something about the relevance of a paper. The approach that we are taking um, is somewhat different. It's basically based on researchers um, enriching documents and asking the right questions uh, so that this signals either the importance of a, of a paper uh, or a book um, or connects it with other documents that might be of relevance for the further readers. So we love our forward links basically where you just put, hey, there's something new on the topic uh, in a way, balances off the typical definition citations. Um, one of our favorite uh, features uh, is called deep links, uh, where you just select any text on, say, I don't know, page 35, and you can send the link directly to somebody, no matter if it's a user of paper hype or not, and then they will land at the exact, exact spot, seeing that something is, uh, well, seeing something interesting usually. So this is more of a um, personally driven way of, of, of sharing and establishing whether something is relevant. So this is a huge part of what I think. Cool. I'll just add one, one little thing that, that I think most reviewers in general know or authors are aware of is that typically a reviewer will actually summarize the article, you know, re-abstract the article at the start of their review. Mm -hmm. And I think those are really, really useful and um, your reviewer keep doing those and see about getting them out there. Yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, let's have one final question then, uh, and then we'll close it down. So with all of these different post-publication peer review platforms, um, how can we actually like exchange information across them instead of creating like isolated silos of different bits of information? That's open to anyone. Mm -hmm. I'm a firm supporter, as my entire team, uh, of any type of open standards and open APIs that will just allow for the exchange of information created in a different uh, This is true for the discussions made on, uh, on Paper Hive, just following W3C standards or co-developing them uh, and making everything citable and um, making it archived. This is crucial. Anything else is, yeah, well, silification in a way. As an aggregation platform, I mean, Science Open is certainly interested in collecting information from wherever we can get it. And there are also other platforms out there. And I think we all have to work for good interoperability because, uh, you know, I also don't see that there will be just simply one solution and uh, that's it. I think there's definitely there's definitely a lot of space for experimentation, but we should make sure by being collaborative 